Thanks to everyone for braving the weather and those insane marathon runners. Um, I know public transportation is pretty bad today. Um, but welcome. Uh, and I also would like to thank Achin and Vivek uh, for attending this. Um, I guess uh, to start out just with bios, um, Achin Bayanek. Uh, wrote The Rise of Hindu Authoritarianism, which we're going to be addressing here. It came out in 1998, correct? That was the first edition. The first edition, the right. Uh, elaborated update. Right. Edition, yeah. And now with uh, the BJP in power again, we're discussing these issues all over again, and there's a new edition. Um, he is based in Delhi. Um, he uh, is a figure in the Coalition for Nuclear Disarmament, a founding member for of the Center for Marxist Studies. Um, and Vivek Chibber, he's a regular uh, <laughs> on the panel circuit these days. Uh, he wrote Post-Colonial Theory and the Spectre of Capital, the debate response of which you can pick up here. Um, he is a professor at NYU and a founding co-editor of Catalyst, which is amazing. Uh, the second issue is out now, it's fantastic. Uh, and I'm Amber Lee Frost. I am on a podcast. Um, so uh, the topic we're dealing with today is uh, why Trump is not a fascist. It's a very, um, it's a very incendiary title for a reason. Um, and I have to say, when people started invoking fascism as a sort of existential threat, more. Um, more vociferously uh, around Trump, I was somewhat ambivalent. Uh, for starters, because I think I, I'm just um, uh, kind of desensitized to the word, because I, I went through a punk phase where you just call everything fascist. My mom is being a total fascist right now. Um, uh, but also because I think the left can often be very pedantic um, about jargon, and I thought, well, you know, maybe we're splitting hairs about this terminology. What actually changed my mind about that was uh, seeing the way the sort of uh, broad left interpreted this uh, existential threat of fascism, and the way particularly the media processed it. Um, I ended up writing um, a piece of media criticism about it for Current Affairs magazine called uh, How to Write About Nazis. And I had a, a kind of list of do's and don'ts. Um, this was after Charlottesville. Um, and it wasn't particularly about Trump, but it was about a far right movement. Uh, and one of the things I said was don't take a righteous or panic tone. This drums up sensationalism, sublimates reality to pathos. For example, after Charlottesville, a Guardian reporter wrote that it was clear that a surging far right has created the rudiments of an organized, effective street fighting force. This is, however, not necessarily true. We don't know how organized the far right are. Information like that would require a lot of serious investigative journalism. What we do know is that the inaccurate is, uh, image of roving bands of violent Nazi street gangs will haunt readers' imaginations. And one has to be very careful with those conclusions. I thought that this was a pretty um, uh, uh, uncontestable thing to say. Uh, the response was about half and half with a lot of people, including the author of that piece, completely furious that I would suggest that the brown shirts are not, in fact, at the gates. Um, also the fact that I ended by saying the institutional right is in power and they are in direct competition with these far right movements. Um, however, uh, Shortly after Charlottesville, so many CEOs quit Trump's Manufacturing Council and another advisory board that he disbanded them. Uh, Gorka and Bannon were gone. Uh, those were the people, the figures that people most associated with sort of crypto white nationalist movements. And the headline on the Financial Times was Trump eyes ambitious tax reform agenda. So it appeared that Republicans were actually resuming business as usual. Uh, nonetheless, people were very resistant to the idea that there was an impending fascist threat looming over us. Uh, 
Um, and I think there are two reasons for this. One, I think there is something about believing you're in a world historic struggle, especially when everyone is panicking, that is very appealing to people. Uh, and two, I think we consider the far right as sort of a, a linear spectrum of here is conservatism and here is fascism. And we believe that it's stagnant, that it doesn't, ex uh, it doesn't adapt, that it doesn't, doesn't change to new conditions. And that's actually very comforting as well uh, because, well, it's an old enemy, it's a familiar enemy, we can fight it the same way. Uh, however, I believe that there is something new happening with these far right wing movements and it's very possible we are risking a lot by misjudging them. Uh, so I think the questions we want to focus on today is one, what are we talking about when we talk about fascism? Um, are they in power? Are they um, at, at, on the precipice of power? And if they're not, who actually is in power? And how do we talk about far right wing movements without invoking fascism? Um, so I think we are going to move to Vivek. Thanks, Amber. And thanks, everyone, for, uh, for coming out on a truly horrible day. Um, it's an enormous pleasure for me uh, to be here uh, in honor of Achin's book. It's an extremely important book, of course, for anybody who's interested in Indian politics, and I'll, I'll speak in a second about, about that, but also, I think, for anybody who's interested in the issue of uh, religious chauvinism and fascism, it's an exemplar of what, kind of, what a sober and careful analysis of these uh, phenomena might look like. And the concern around this kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, right-wing uh, authoritarianism or fascism is now quickly becoming a global concern. Achin's book, therefore, I think, arrives in a very timely way, and I think that's why um, Versa was very wise in asking him to do a second edition of it, because what seemed like something of a remote possibility in 97, 98, to many people today, seems much more of a live issue. And I think the book, for that reason, is extremely important. It's also, I think, a testament to Achin's um, long journey and his position uh, as a genuinely uh, engaged and important intellectual an intellectual of the kind that rapidly is disappearing as intellectuals become gobbled up by universities and by academia, which systematically destroy any possibility, in my view, of people taking up uh, issues in an engaged and an enlightened way because of the enormous pressure to specialize, to become technical, to become essentially uh, glorified kind of um, uh, technicians in wh whatever they're doing. Achin, um, as he will be happy to tell you, um, has had a very uh, unusual route uh, in his uh, journey as an intellectual, and it's worth thinking about because it, it also, I think, shows the, uh, the possibilities that his generation and that the intellectual culture around that generation opened up for a time. Um, he grew up uh, in a very itinerant fashion. Uh, he was born in, in India, right, Achin? My first six years were spent in China. In China. That's right. China uh, spent much of his uh, adolescent life in England and the United States, uh, was a militant in a left organization in England, went back to India uh, in uh, his 20s. Uh, yeah, late 20s. Became a journalist. And from 78 to 90, he worked uh, in the Times of India and became actually the assistant editor of the Times of India, which is the largest and most influential newspaper uh, in the country at the time and continues to be. And it's important because Indian newspapers, before they were essentially destroyed in the last 10 or 12 years, they were a remarkable phenomenon in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. You had people with genuine literacy, real intellectual heft, as the op-ed, uh, regular contributors to the op-ed pages, actually, as the actual journalists. And Achen is somebody coming out of a left background with incredible uh, uh, depth in his reading and historical knowledge, who then achieves a quite high position in the, the, one of the top Indian newspapers. He was um, booted out of the newspaper for leading a gigantic strike and effectively shutting down the newspaper, and in 1990, they got rid of him, as any respectable newspaper ought to have. Um, Achen then 
uh, gets a five-year fellowship at the Nehru uh, Memorial Museum and Library, which is the most prestigious research institution in India, independent research institution. And that's where I actually first met him. We had a very brief encounter around 1995. Uh, and uh, after his tenure at Nehru Memorial Library, he now made a lateral move into Delhi University. Now, this is important. Can't happen in the US because American professors are much too anxious about their credentials. And, and even in India now, it would be difficult. In social science and in the humanities, the, the dirty little secret of social sciences is anybody can do it. And so they spend all their time making sure nobody can do it. Achin, without having his PhD, not only became uh, a permanent faculty member in Delhi University's political science department, in 2007 he became the chair of the department and then dean. Now Delhi University is the premier institution in India. And here is this old time trot, militant, uh, labor organizer who got fired for leading a strike ends up being the dean of the most prestigious university in the country. The, the right did not forgive him for this, and in fact, they, uh, I think, th Ajahn, did they, did they sue you for not having the credentials? They, they took me to court and said he doesn't have credentials, so he should be kicked out. But that was only after I became chair. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he retired finally uh, in uh, 2012, I think. Um, and uh, then, uh, after 2012, Achin became the moving force behind a new outfit uh, in India called the Center for Marxist Studies. The Center for Marxist Studies is based in Delhi. It's an educational uh, and research institution, and its most important activity is that it is the, it holds two schools, uh, week-long schools essentially in India, one during the summer, one during the winter, and it is uh, uh, a school for militants on the basics of how capitalism works, the history of socialism, Marxist theory, um, and it's the only such endeavor in India which is non-sectarian, uh, explicitly uh, anti-Stalinist and democratic, and it's turned out to be quite an extraordinary success. Uh, it, it brings in about 120 people a year, and because of its non-sectarian status, uh, uh, members of parties of all, the entire spectrum of the Indian left uh, now attend it, and it's become very well known, and Achin is the main reason it exists now. So uh, in spite of uh, his let's say maturity. <laughs> he swears he's only 44, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that might not be true. Uh, Ajahn continues to be an absolutely vital part, not just of the Indian left, but of the Indian intellectual scene. And for that reason, it's a, a real honor for me and a pleasure uh, to be, uh, to be uh, present uh, at this celebration of his work. I do want to now, um, contextualize the book and what's at stake in it. And um, Jake very provocatively titled this, uh, this session, Trump is not a fascist. Um, the point here, though, is not about whether Trump himself has fascistic leanings or not. I doubt that he does. I, I doubt that he even knows what it means. But the issue is not whether Trump is a fascist. The issue is whether Trump betokens the possibility of a fascist turn in the United States. I mean, that has to do with the larger issue of the structure of politics in the United States, outside the United States and Europe, and then of course the Indian context, which is what Achin will talk about. I would like to focus on two things in the few minutes that I have remaining. One is, as Amber suggested, we need to define our terms. So let's be clear, let's have a working definition of it so that in the conversation that follows, we won't be talking past one another. And then let's see uh, whether, given that definition, uh, in the US and more widely, the possibility of fascism is a real one. I'm going to use fascism in a very, very broad, generic way. And the reason for that is it's sometimes people, when they want to say fascism isn't around the corner, they'll define it so narrowly that it literally means fascism is whatever exactly Hitler happened to be doing in 19, August 1937 or something like that. So you can define your way out of an argument by saying, well, unless it's exactly like Germany, it can't be fascism. Obviously, the people who are worried about fascism do not intend to, to convey fr from the concept something identical to a snapshot of Germany in that time. They are worried in a more broad-based way. And I want to then use a definition that's also more broad-based so we can give respect to people's anxieties. So by fascism, for this discussion, uh, if people agree, I'm just going to mean basically a right-wing dictatorship with strong kind of populist elements to it. And by dictatorship, what I mean is the, uh, the cessation, the uh, uh, abridgment of democratic rights, basic civil liberties, a one-party rule, uh, and the uh, 
uh, also the, yeah, I said civil liberties. So if that, if people are okay with that definition, uh, Achin? Yeah, I mean, I'd add more the question of crisis. Okay. But this is at least broad right, based. Yeah, what I agree with okay. You. If that's what we mean by fascism then, it's hard to imagine that there's a real danger of it, either in the United States or I would say even abroad, although India is probably among the established democracies, the one place where I think there is some real, there's some real room for concern. And uh, I think Achin will go into that and we can talk about it uh, and have a more of a conversation about it later. The fundamental difference between the original fascist regimes to which we look for an example and from which we try to understand what the conditions are for their uh, origins of their rise. The fundamental difference between those regimes and now is this. In the interwar period, when these regimes came to power in Europe, they were essentially top-down endeavors, by which I mean fascism came about because of the difficulty and indeed the failure of European ruling elites to destroy a labor movement that was very well organized, which was posing a real threat from below, and whose programmatic ideology was one of, at the very least, making serious inroads into property rights, if not destroying them altogether. Starting from the 1908, 1907, 1908, all the way into the 1930s, you see all over Central and Western Europe, communist and socialist parties, gaining strength, at the very least holding on to their territory, and conservative and establishment forces being unable to smash them. The turn to fascism comes about as kind of a desperate resort in which ruling classes, that is to say, the corporate business banking community, essentially gives the green light to people like Hitler and willingly goes with the narrowing of the political scene essentially saying to fascists, okay, you do it because we've been unable to do it. And the fury of these fascist forces, the brown shirts, et cetera, is unleashed. Now, there is a significant element of participation from below, of middle classes, of the poor, but you, that should not uh, um, give you the impression that fascism comes about as a molecular process in which groups uh, of the poor, working people, slowly aggregate in numbers and power until they finally take over the state. What is essentially happening is that there is enormous turmoil and anxiety uh, among the lower orders, but the fuel, the money, the strategic uh, uh, assistance, and most importantly, the green light comes from above. And it's that green light which allows them then to aggregate into a national political force. So if you had to summarize it, it's that it's a movement, for the, the movement towards fascism is from above, the resistance to fascism is from below. That's what's going on. And indeed, fascism comes to power by smashing and breaking the power of organized labor. The difference today is this. The sprouts of fascism are visible in the lower orders, from below, but the indifference is among the elites. This is the US scene. And this is what the left needs to get its mind around because the hysteria that Amber talked about fails to properly appreciate the massive difference between the interwar period and today in the advanced world. What we are seeing in the advanced world is that there is absolutely no threat from labor or even from below that elites have to worry about. So the first question to ask yourself is this. Since fascism involves not just a destruction of the organized left, but also a uh, relinquishment of organized political power by establishment parties, because you're seeing in fascism a turn to a one-party state. The question is why would they give up their power? Why would the Democrats give up their access to power? Why in Western Europe would Christian Democratic parties, uh, the centrist parties, even the labor parties, which are now establishment parties, why would they give up their power? Something. There has to be a, a, a crisis deep enough, a sense of, uh, of impending doom on their part to give power to a narrow stratum the way the fascists in the interwar period were given that power. We don't see a movement towards that in any way. What we do see in the United States is working class anxiety giving rise to certain far right groups. But interestingly, the response on the part of the American ruling class, the rise of those groups, 
is either disgust or a, a quite decisive move to suppress them. So Amber mentioned um, what happens after Charlottesville. I want to uh, stress this point. If Charlottesville were uh, an emblem of a massive shift within the sentiments of the ruling establishment, what we ought to have seen was that when Trump first delays his response and then comes out and equivocates and then says that actually as people on the right and on the left, they're all the same, what we ought to have seen was something within business circles, within the media, et cetera, which added fuel to that view. What you saw instead was the day after Trump makes this pronouncement, the few elements of the business community in the US that are backing him collectively resign. He has two councils that he set, that he set up. One of them is the uh, Strategic and Policy Forum, which, had, uh, which was uh, headed by business, uh, large corporations, including an Indian who was, um, I've forgotten her name now, uh, who's the head of Pepsi, I think. Oh, and then the Manufacturing Jobs Initiative. Oh, uh, Nui. Nui, right. Both of these councils called each other and collectively resigned within two days. Why? Because they thought Trump wasn't coming down decisively enough against the far right forces in Charlottesville. Now, you might ask yourself, why would the American capitalist class be so minimally indifferent to, but apparently quite hostile to the possibility of the rise of these fascist groups? The answer is quite simple. Fascism is not an easy prospect, even for ruling forces. It's, it's hard to maintain. It generates resistance from below. It's, it it uh, uh, internationally makes the United States a pariah. But more importantly, given all these costs, why would they need it when over the past 25 years, the American establishment has gotten just about everything it wants? The last 25 years have been a period of the American corporate community going from strength to strength, victory to victory. Fascism actually generates the possibility of galvanizing the left and starting a movement against the corporate community. It is therefore, in my view, regardless of what Trump himself might believe or not believe, his far-right leanings, his uh, uh, mollycoddling of people like Bannon, even though he's now fired Bannon and all that, all of that has actually isolated him within the American establishment rather than presenting him as the sharp edge of a turn towards fascism. The American establishment knows that it's got a model that works beautifully. And that model is authoritarianism, not by dis denying people their rights, but authoritarianism by making it difficult for people to actually effectuate those rights. The model, the American model of rule is, you hand over power to business, you atomize and isolate labor, you take away their encompassing organization so they have no ability for collective action, and now you put them in front of the TV and you tell them, shut up and shop. And what's happened over the past 40 years is that the move to the right has essentially come in a consensual fashion through breeding uh, a sense of loss, cynicism, through atomization, rather than through a frontal assault the way fascism does it. In the US, therefore, for the left, to obsess over this fascist threat is to run the real danger of focusing on a sideshow, on battles and issues which, for the ruling establishment, are completely uh, um, of symbolic value, and leaving the real struggles that are going on completely abandoned. The real struggles right now are over the major policy shift that we're seeing around the tax initiative, around environmental pol policy, around the court appointments. It's not these, these sad slobs coming out in Charlottesville and trying to gain a uh, toehold for themselves. This is not to say they should be ignored, but the hysteria needs to be modulated somewhat. Now, beyond the United States, in Europe, et cetera, if you look, what you notice is that even though in a country here, in Germany there, in Austria, there's a, some rooms in which the right seems to be advancing. The story over the past four years have been the wind being taken out of its sails. And the reason for that, again, is pretty obvious. This is not a massively organized, top-down movement that is gaining traction. It's still basically electoral. It's still being expressed through electoral institutions. And it's sh going that way, voters are moving towards the far right, primarily 
because they feel that's the only, org only political force that's speaking to their concerns and their interests. Over the last three years, as these new far left, or at least we should call them genuinely social democratic electoral alternatives have uh, become available, Corbyn, Mélenchon, in the United States, Sanders, what you've seen is that the electoral successes of the far right are immediately now starting to wane. So it means again that there is no ideologically formed electoral movement that's pushing for fascism. It's actually a sign of desperation on the part of the poor, and now that left alternatives are becoming available, they're moving away from the far right towards the left. That means that we, we might already have seen this movement crest in Europe. We might already have been through the worst. So in the US and Europe, in my view, the US, the threat of the fascist takeover from on a scale of one, uh, zero to 10, it's somewhere around zero. In Europe, it's slightly more because they are more well organized. Achin now, I think, will say something about why in India, even though compared to Europe and the US, the threat is more real, it's still probably a remote possibility rather than a real one. <coughs> well, thank you, Amber. And uh, thank you, Vivek, for your more than generous and complimentary um, introduction about me. I was thinking that you might even end up praising my hairstyle. <laughs> but anyway, um, <coughs> let me say, first of all, I very strongly agree with what uh, Vivek is saying about the whole question of fascism. And another way of putting it is that insofar as fascism emerges in a capitalist state, and a, ca and a capitalist state is always a class state, fascism really emerges to power when the relationship of forces between the state and the classes behind it is much more weighted in favor of the state, saying it's the most autonomous. And that's related to a question of crisis, which itself is related to the question of working class power from below. Hmm? I'll put it slightly different. I'll do two things. One is I'll say something about this whole question of fascism, because I've written a, f a long chapter, uh, which is not simply discussing the Indian situation, but more broadly this whole question of the fascist paradigm. And then I'll say something about the uh, uh, the Indian context here. Even at the far right, as Amber said, there's a spectrum. Question number one, are all far right forces fascist? Surely the answer to that is no, that you can think of certain far right forces that are not fascist. Hmm? Second, do many far right forces have characteristics or features that are similar to that of uh, fascist forces in the interwar period? Yes. Does that make them fascist? Where exactly are you going to put fascism on the spectrum of the far right? Are you going to put it at the extreme end? Hmm? Now there's a difference even between the way Marxists and liberals have treated it. Liberals, whenever they see a movement which is popular, which has fascist characteristics, they say fascism is there. Hmm? Vivek pointed out the importance of the question of dictatorship. If you look at even how Mussolini defined it, but let's leave that aside here, Central to fascism is not only the question of having a popular base and a movement, but also the question of establishing a fascist dictatorship. And that's something that's very important. And you have two ways of looking at the question of fascism in any society. Either you talk in terms of a fascist organism that matures. The point was Mayak is making about saying molecular development here. Or you recognize that's the wrong way to understand. Many groups may have a potential for fascism, but it's not the fascist organism that matures, it's the fascist situation that matures, which means it's the question of crisis. What is it that propels the capitalist class or the ruling classes themselves to want to go for the, capitalist, uh, for, for the fascist option? And that's a much more remote, a much more difficult thing, especially because unlike in the interwar period, among the population as a whole, there's a much stronger commitment to the question of even bourgeois democracy and bourgeois rights. That's one. So I think that one has to be very, very careful before jumping to conclusions. If you like, what I've said in my book is that to understand fascism, understand it as a unity of three moments. When there is a kind of movement huh, of support for a fa an organization that has a fascist potential, and there's a fascist dictatorship, but in between is a question of what is it that enables it to come to power? And that's not something that is automatically written in the nature of that particular organization, but depends upon so much more. And in this world today, as compared to even the interwar period, what happens at the international level and its opposition to the question of that even becomes more important. So I think that's one thing that we have to be very careful about. I've written about it, and uh, 
at the risk of, uh, I, I would suggest that that's some one chapter that is interesting to read. You can benefit it in two ways. Either you will find it of some value or you will fall asleep if you're suffering from insomnia. Uh, but anyway, that's it. Okay, let me take the uh, question of India. The debate in India is very much preoccupied with whether the BJP, the forces of Hindutva, the party, the BJP is a fascist force or not. Let me say something good about it because this was a debate that was pr overwhelmingly on the left. And it was not by liberals. And the reason why liberals did not have the same understanding of the BJP and the force of Hindutva is because what they want always for stabilized capitalism is if you like two forces or two uh, competing forces of either what they can call a center left, even if it's very a right wing force. For example, the Congress party is often referred to as center left when it's really actually a right wing force and a center right party. And therefore the liberal attitude to the BJP and others was that yes, yes, there are some terrible fringe elements which are very, very dangerous and that's bad and you know, undemocratic and all that, but maybe coming to power they can also be moderated. And in any case, the uh, BJP is not the same thing as the RSS. Now, a number of liberals have got quite disturbed because in fact, things have not worked out the way here. And I'm talking about liberals like Pratap Banu Mehta, Ram Goa, and others, who were justifiably disillusioned with the Congress, but were soft on the BJP. So the strength of the left was that it recognized that what you're dealing with is a far-right force. But having said that it's a far-right force, does not automatically make it into a serious fascist danger. It's a much more complicated and difficult uh, process, but at least that was, if you like, uh, uh, a virtue uh, of that. Uh, why is it, well, I've already explained the question of the situation. Vivek has emphasized the question of resistance from below, from the working class movement, the question of a, um, a capitalist crisis, the question of the options that the uh, ruling classes have, and so on. This is much more a form of authoritarian populism, right-wing authoritarian populism. And you have two kinds, the, the basic form of right-wing authoritarianism today on a world scale is authoritarian nationalism. Authoritarian nationalism can come from above. Think of China. It's an authoritarian nationalist, this thing here. You can also have to some extent an authoritarian nationalism that comes from below. But when you say come from below, be very careful. I agree with Vivek when even if you talk about Le Pen and other parties, these have acted as pressure groups, if you like, pushing the spectrum to the right and on specific policies, helping the mainstream political parties pursue uh, political policies. You'll even have to make a distinction even among these groups which are electoral, which have an influence electorally. Do they have grassroots organizations that are deep? in society here. And you will find this as a characteristic of the BJP RSS, but not a characteristic of a whole lot of, a lot, whole lot of other parties that are far right. I don't know about the question of Hungary, maybe they have it over there, but as far as Western Europe is concerned, as far as the United States is concerned, it's not there. So you have a force in India which is implanted. It's very different from your Le Pen's and others because you're talking about a force which has an existence of 90 continuous years. And it has a cadre force, cadre force, which is implanted in civil society here. And yet, one has to be very, very careful not to talk in terms of a fascist danger, but it's bad enough what it represents. Because you have a far-right force in power, and what is its project? In my view, its project is not the elimination of liberal democracy. Huh? As it is, India has, if you like, a stable macro-level structure of democracy and a lot of violence at the meso and micro-level, but still, it's significant. It's not the elimination of that and the establishment of fascist dictatorship. It's a diminishing of it. It's a restriction of it. Hmm? A restriction which comes about, if you like, one, because they have a project in the Indian case of inferiorizing, terrorizing, and ghettoizing a particular um, uh, community. If you like, the difference between uh, right-wing populism and left-wing populism is that both may have a rhetoric of which is anti the elite, but right-wing populism is not a problem for, for the elite, even if they uh, come to power uh, here. But the minority, that right-wing populism has to justify itself and strengthen itself in terms of popularity is going to be a minority that is weak and vulnerable. Immigrants refugee crisis, this, that, etc. In the case of left-wing populism, the minority that they are opposed to, 
actually is the powerful, the rich and the powerful here. But in the Indian case, I would even may surprise you, yes, Islamophobia is growing, but I think in the West, Islamophobia is a much more contingent development. Hmm? It's there, it's something we have to oppose, etc. but it's contingent. I remember when I was fighting part of the anti-racist movement in England, it's what is biological racism and black that was important. And in fact, different from now, ne one never talked in terms of blacks and browns and this and that. It was a political concept in which all of those who faced racism were opposed to that. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, so, um, what was that? Sorry, where was contingency that? Contingency of uh, Islamophobia, yeah. Yeah, the contingency of Islamophobia. In the Indian case, Islam of, uh, anti Islam and anti Muslimness is foundational to uh, uh, the forces uh, of Hindutva. Hmm? And as far as this minority is concerned, inferiorization, terrorization, ghetto, uh, ghettoization, making them effectively second class citizens in various ways. As for those who oppose them, who are not necessarily Muslims or Christians, isolate them, threaten them, monitor them, move towards the surveillance states, reduce that. And in that sense also, because it's very interesting in the Indian context that this far right force is not particularly different from the Congress party in its economic policies. It accelerates it, fine. In its foreign policy, it's still committed to the question of a strategic alliance with Israel and the United States. It adds, of course, a certain ideological dimension of anti-Muslimness and aggressiveness. Uh, Zionism, for example, I think just before this meeting, there was a meeting of Jew, uh, Jewish for peace, Jews for peace here. Yeah. Zionism is not anti-Islamic, it's anti-Palestinian, but it's very happy to piggyback today on the development of Islamophobia. So this is there uh, here. So that its far right character comes, if you like, at its domestic level, in which, of course, it is seeking to establish an effect, a, uh, uh, an effective not in name, a Hindu state. A state, if you like, in which there is the permanent inferior, uh, inferiorization of uh, others and, of course, the restriction and uh, alienation uh, um, uh, and diminishing of, uh, of, of democracy. Its conception of Hindu nationalism hmm, is what could be called a sleeping beauty concept of nationalism. Um, are you familiar with this sleeping beauty concept of nationalism? Well, in the Indian case, uh, you're all familiar, of course, in a way that most Indian audiences may not be about the story of Sleeping Beauty, right? So in the case of India, the Sleeping Beauty is the essential Hinduness of India. Hmm? But it has been slumbering. It's related to uh, an 18th century organic nationalism which came in Germany and elsewhere. It's slumbering. And it needs to be awakened by India's Prince Charming, which are the forces of Hindutva, which will give it the kiss of politics, and it'll run. But it was slumbering. And who put it to slumber? Which was the evil witch that put it to slumber? Was it Turks, the invading Turks? Was it Afghans? Was it Mughals? Was it Persians? The answer is no. The term that is used is Muslims. Because if you say Muslims, you combine all of them, and you also make complicit all the people in India who are Muslims, even not part of that invasion, who've come through migration, whatever, and you made that the enemy. That, in a sense, is their project much more to do uh, here. So I would say that one has to be very careful, even in the Indian context, where I say that a far-right force is actually in power, in jumping to conclusions. Why is this important? This is important because you have to be very careful about the relationship between uh, your theoretical understanding and your programmatic perspective. Hmm? It's often the case that your theoretical understanding leads you towards a programmatic perspective. A programmatic perspective is how you fight the damn thing, right? What are the ways in which you, what are the alliances you make in order to fight it? Uh, sometimes there's a direct line which can be very dangerous and misleading. Let me give you an example. In the Marxist tradition, you had a number of people of the Marxist, uh, of, the, uh, of the communist, uh, well, in Marx, in Marx, in the, in the communist tradition, who accepted the idea that you could, build, you could build socialism in one country. And that was what the Soviet Union was doing. And from that theoretical perspective came a programmatic perspective of justifying and defending what the Soviet Union did at the international level, which in many cases was a betrayal of revolutionary aspirations and struggles. But that followed logically from that. However, sometimes your theoretical differences 
do not necessarily mean that much because they may not lead to programmatic differences. Hmm? The programmatic differences, how do you fight it? So for example, in the Marxist tradition of those who were very critical of the Soviet Union, and one thing that I think Marxists and the, uh, 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 the anti-bureaucratic left has to do with, has to complete, consistently remind people that the most committed, consistent people who opposed the brutalities of what went in the name of socialism were not liberals. They were anti-Stalinist and non-Maoist left. And the honor of that belongs to the left. It doesn't belong to liberals. We were prepared to oppose that long before, and even when liberals for various kinds were prepared to make accommodations in the name of compromises, rationality, whatever you want to call it, realism, and so on, et cetera. Yeah. So there were those who said Soviet Union is state capitalist. There were those who said that it's not state capitalist, it's a break from capitalism, but obviously not socialism. But the programmatic perspective was a common one overthrow the lot who was ruling there, whether you call that a bureaucratic caste or whether you call it a ruling class. So I think even in the Indian context, here I think what Vivek said is very careful, the dangers of characterizing it as fascist are greater. In the Indian context, there are serious dangers because it can mislead you, it can mislead you in terms of not realizing that you still have structures of liberal democracy which can be used to fight against that, huh? that you don't exaggerate it, but at the same time, on the question of alliances, you might find that somebody that considers the BJP fascist and others who do not consider it fascist can come together and say, for example, they think that, no, you shouldn't have a strategic alliance with uh, the Congress party in order to fight it and so on here. So I think the programmatic perspective is there. Therefore, in the Indian context, what we are trying to do is that we are trying not to have bitter arguments against those who disagree with us theoretically, but to have much more concrete arguments about how best to fight it. And I think that's something that we have to keep on doing uh, uh, in the Indian context. I'll stop here for a moment. And maybe I'll take some oh. uh, yeah, um, I guess moving forward from that, uh, I'll probably ask a question or two. But if people want to, are we doing Q&A at this point? Somebody got a mic? OK. Oh, well, why don't we, yeah, line up. But I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll do the first two. Maybe it makes sense to allow a little bit of discussion before we open up to the crowd. Sure. Uh, I think this event is a live stream, and I think it works best to sure. allow discussion between the people that are here online. By all means. Um, so I was wondering if you could actually go into a little bit about, and I, I mentioned this earlier, I think there is a risk in, in misidentification. Um, particularly because I, I, I think there, like hysteria is also is always a risk. Um, but what do you think are the benefits of properly, or could you expand a little more on that? You talked about alliances, but of sort of properly drawing out a map of this complex far right landscape. Okay, in the Indian context, which is different from the context here in the West, because here you don't have a far right force in power. For what I agree with Vivek when he says that whatever you may think about Trump in terms of his far right leanings and all, the Republican Party may have aspects or dimensions within it which are far right, or pressures, et cetera, but the Republican Party in power is not a far right force in my view. Hmm? That's there. Yeah. You have a far right force uh, uh, in India. How do you fire it? My understanding is that the rise of right wing populism and far-right forces over the last so many years is obviously connected to the dislocations that have been created by the spread of neoliberal uh, uh, capitalism, neoliberal globalization. Uh, of, uh, that's obviously a crucial element in it. Uh, one has suggested that since the late 1970s, which broadly corresponds to the emergence of neoliberalism on a world scale, what you've had is you've had the rise of what's been called the politics of cultural exclusivisms of various kinds. Hmm? And they have taken three basic forms, irredentist nationalisms, um, uh, religious extremisms, and um, uh, racist and anti-immigrant xenophobia. And you have racist and anti-immigrant xenophobia in the West. You had irredentist, uh, irredentist nationalisms in the former Second World and you've had religious extremisms of various kinds uh, 
throughout uh, the world. Obviously, this has to be connected to what happens at the international level precisely because it's there. But at the same time, if you're going to have a stabilization of neoliberal globalization, and you're in a world in which you have on one hand transnational capital moving everywhere, and on the other hand, a, uh, the existence of multiple nation states, then the stabilization of right-wing economics of a more extreme kind than even earlier uh, um, uh, capitalist economics can only come about through the stabilization at the national level of a right-wing ideology and a right-wing politics, which will vary from country to country in the forms that it particularly takes here. In the Indian case, as I've said, you have a far-right fo force. I don't believe that this far-right force in the long term, this is different from whether the BJP can even be defeated electorally. This far-right force with its implantation of civil society, one, it's a long-term struggle. Second, it requires us to develop the kind of capacities to penetrate uh, in civil society to set up the kind of institutions and structures that they have been succeeded in doing. If you look at organizations like Hamas and elsewhere, they also exist because they also address secular needs not just religious needs, but secular needs of various kinds of forces there. So that's a long-term struggle. We have to do that. And in that struggle, to overthrow neoliberalism, my own perspective is an anti-neoliberal uh, 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 platform movement, um, uh, what should you call it, coalition of various, uh, anti-neoliberal. Now, if it's going to be anti-neoliberal, right, then what are you going to do with a lot of mainstream forces that are not anti-neoliberal? So my long-term perspective, if you like, is strengthen the left, connect the left to a variety of progressive social movements, and have a tactical relationship for specific issues in specific contexts with other forces on this issue, on that issue, on that. And you have a long-term struggle um, uh, towards that in the Indian context. The situation outside of India is not that powerless. You can have much greater uh, confidence that uh, you can move it here. In the Indian uh, situation, I'm pessimistic in the sense that it's much more deeply entrenched in longer term development, but it doesn't mean that you're going to have the elimination of uh, liberal democracies, that you will not be able to use those kinds of resources. And even if you make gains, electorally speaking, in terms of the BJP losing out in some particular states or coming with a reduced majority, it shifts it. In other words, the movement towards it will require us to push for social democratic demands which help to shift the relationship of forces, but it can't stop there. Basically, what I'm saying is I think that when we reach the stage where we can be much more confident of defeating neoliberalism, ironically enough, the question of moving towards a break with capitalism is going to actually take place. Because I really don't think that in the Indian context you can have a kind of humane, social democratic, green capitalism of the way that you might have had in the golden age in the West. In fact, I'm interested to know what you, Vivek, and you might think about whether it's possible to have a stable social democratic or green capitalism as a, uh, what should we say, as a transition point or as a halfway house towards that? Or, or will it be the case that in the movement towards this, which is important, social democratic demands and so on, the question of moving further will actually get thrown up much more quickly? I'd be interested to know about that as well. That's a big question. Uh, th yeah, that's a big question. And I'm, um, it's very hard to, one can say anything one wants right now because we'll be dead before any of that, that stuff happens. So <laughs> I, I can go on record saying just about anything and nobody will care no, about it. I'll be dead, it, not you, <laughs> don't say that. But it, it's very hard to make uh, predictions about whether social democratic, uh, any kind of social democratic possibility will put uh, a post-capitalism uh, on the agenda. And for what it's worth, in my view, uh, no, I, I think What's different about this era, so we're, we're segueing into not talking about fascism for a minute, and I'm happy to do that. What's different about this era right now, and the era when social demo democratic uh, governance actually flourished, which is the post-war 45 to the, the late 70s, was that it was a lot easier to sustain social democracy in the 50s and 60s because it was an era of rapid growth, uh, very uh, high profitability, um, and a, a high productivity and therefore lots of profits to be funneled back into higher wages. Whereas right now it's very low growth, low productivity, low profits, which means that employers are much less inclined to agree to uh, wage demands, to taxation demands compared to the 1950s and 60s. Now the question then becomes how deep will their intransigence be 
right now. If the intransigence is so deep that they're unwilling to give up anything, then Achen's uh, scenario of demands for social democracy escalating into something much more ambitious is a real one uh, because every single demand will be seen as by employers as a fight to the death. Um, so are things that dire? I think not. I, I do, however, believe that because of the era right now, to get even mild reforms out of the corporate community, the, the business community in Europe and the US will require very militant struggles compared to the 50s and 60s. Um, now, that's depressing in some ways because the organizational strength of the labor movement is so weak compared to the immediate post-war period. On the other hand, uh, we shouldn't make the mistake, which many progressives do, of thinking that any change that comes about has to replicate the, uh, the strategies and the sequence of events of past years. We have to be willing to see how events are unfolding, and one of the things we've seen in the past five years alone is that electoral mobilization seems to have some effect and elites are willing to make adjustments to those electoral mobilizations. I've been sobered by that. I found it, a, on one hand, a, a very, um, mm, shall we say, uh, appealing possibility because, as I said, in terms of strength in the, la in the workplace and in neighborhoods, labor parties, Orga organizations of the left have very little traction right now. So if the electoral ar arena gives us some space for maneuver, I think that's a, that's a very good thing. I doubt it can go very far beyond a point because uh, once the demands become expansive enough that they actually require a revi revitalization and resuscitation of the welfare state, I think resistance on the part of elites will grow quite a bit. Um, at that point, Uchin's question will become then legitimate. So how deep is that resistance going to be f uh, from elites? And uh, it's hard for me to say. I do believe, taking the conversation back now to fascism, that if you're going, the, uh, the essential point Uchin is making, that countering this movement to the right requires long, slow, patient organizing. That's the key lesson here. Keep in mind that what's everything that that the Trump phenomenon right now is merely the capstone on a three decades long process in the United States. And that process has been one that both parties have been participating in. Neither party is gonna be willing to give up its prerogatives and its power in favor of the other and go towards fascism. There's no need for it. Furthermore, for those of you who've been on the left or been around politics for a while, you'll remember, I can attest from personal experience, at least from 1992 onwards, Every four years, around the electoral cycle and its immediate aftermath, there is a hysteria around the fascist threat in the US. It is at least since the Clinton uh, uh, victory in 1992. Every time there's a surge to the right, among progressives, there's a m mass anxiety that this right now is the first step towards fascism. This has been going on for about 25 years now. At the very least, we should say, eh, okay, maybe we're overdoing this. And instead of stopping everything you're doing and running down to the five Klansmen who happen to be showing up somewhere uh, and overnumbering them 2,000 to one, uh, maybe the long-term process is one of building organizational and institutional capacities because this other stuff is a sideshow. Um. Can I just give one simple example of the abuse of fascism? On the left, it took place, 1991. In India, you mean? No, oh. internationally. Oh. Saddam Hussein is a fascist. I'm a leftist. I'm opposed to US imperialism. But in this choice between fascism and imperialism, I'm going to choose imperialism. And therefore, I'm going to justify the invasion of, the, uh, of Iraq. That and was the first of um, several episodes when a big chunk of the left intelligentsia went over to the right because of this issue. Fred Halliday was the most yes. uh, prominent example mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. Yeah, we actually also saw it and um, we saw a few defectors go to support the invasion of Iraq in Democratic Socialists of America, which is very strange because a lot of those people came out of the anti-war movement. Um, yeah, I mean, we're in a strange position because social democracy in America is like wildly popular. Um, and unlike fascism, I, I think 
uh, it's the sort of thing that benefits from grassroots support or can be built on grassroots support. It can be an organic thing. You know, fascism has to be top down. Social democracy can be bottom up. Um, the problem is we have no political institutions to make these things happen. And they don't, they are not manifested from you know the sheer force of people wanting these things. Um, I'm pretty traditional about the necessity of, of uh, a militant trade unionist movement, um, which we do not have right now. Um, and you know my, I'm pretty explicit about the fact that my long-term goal is um, a labor party, which makes zero sense in the political institution we have right now anyway, but nonetheless. Um, I kind of uh, believe that our role as leftists are to redirect the conversation towards very old solutions to the exact same problem. I don't think things have changed. Um, I think there's a lot of focus on these kind of technocratic solutions, um, which I think in the wake of things like environmental disasters, people are gonna be like, well, let's, let's do UBI or something, which is something I think capitalists would be more than happy to throw at people, just to throw them a bone. Um, I am, I don't wanna talk about it in terms of optimism or, or pessimism or whatever, but I do believe the, the fear of disaster or, and the fear of fascism is not particularly productive towards building the kind of institutions we would need for social democracy, for a real functional social democracy. Um, I think that kind of panic and that sort of, um, the, the, the propaganda, we must, we must keep ourselves safe from, from the, uh, you know, the brown shirts at the gate is actually what gave us Trump because it's not a positive program. People don't respond to it. You can't really build anything about it. Puts you entirely on the defense, and you have no offense. So I mean, it's it's we have to get to build a a, a sophisticated and heavily organized trade unionist movement that's literally the, the floor for everything that needs to happen, and um, it happens it needs to happen like yesterday. Um, but you know, it's not impossible. <laughs> so maybe we can open it up now. Sure. Sure. Uh, who had a question? question? I think Joan did. Did you have a question? <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, I had two questions. He does not need a microphone. Uh, Yeah. First one, I think. yeah, I'll take both, and you can, you can come in, too. <laughs> um, yeah, there is this partial rehabilitation of Bush going on. Um, rehabilitation might be the wrong word, because he wasn't exactly exiled or anything by the American establishment or by the Republican Party. Uh, his project did fail in Iraq, but on the other hand, uh, in terms of his domestic policy and his broad foreign policy goals, the establishment didn't despise him in any way. Um, so maybe rehabilitation is the wrong word, but there's no doubt that he's being trotted back into the public domain now. And 
what might be the reason. I don't think Jonah is, is a, a liberal hysteria or anything like that. I think what it is, it's, it's a sign of the, in, the deepening rift between Trump and the Republican Party, the, what's called the Republican establishment. There was, I would say for about eight months, there was an effort on some sections of the Republican establishment because Trump had power, because uh, there was a possibility of using that power to make further inroads politically, there was this kind of uh, very guarded rapprochement between the Republicans and Trump. And now what you're seeing is that's really, even the last vestiges of that are falling apart. And so Bush is being brought back because of the, uh, the you know, you, the, uh, Americans tend to treat their presidents as, as monarchs. So he's being brought back to restore the, the regalia, the, the, uh, the, the prestige of the institution. And, and it's kind of hysteric, it's funny because that if you, I think most of you are old enough to remember the Bush presidency. He was treated as a clown by the media, a, a, a clown that, of course, in, was an expression of the party, but nonetheless a clown. Nobody thought Bush Jr. Uh, was uh, kind of uh, a, a symbol of the, the regality of the American presidency. They, they saw him as kind of this frat boy who got elected. Now, now that it's, you know, what, how many, 10 years in the, uh, in the past, since we have no historical memory in this country, he can be brought back up as this uh, legendary figure. But what I, I think all it, uh, uh, it represents, Jonah, is the, basically the Republican Party saying, even this guy was better than the rest of you. Now, the question of Modi versus Trump is interesting. Um, you, you point to something very interesting. There are two things here. One is, I don't think the big difference, although it's, it's, it's certainly a difference, I don't think a huge difference is that Modi is organically uh, connected to the Indian bourgeoisie versus Trump who's not. That is a difference. Modi is much more organically connected to the Indian bourgeoisie. But then, so is the Congress party. Yes. So it's, there's no difference there. Both parties are parties of capital as much as the Democrats and the Republicans are in this country. The big difference is that Modi is at the helm of a genuine political organization that has internal cohesiveness, that has roots in civil society, that is programmatically coherent and committed, and that is absolutely clear about its strategy. The BJP is one of the few real parties in the world right now. Europe doesn't have a party like the BJP. The US, these parties aren't, in the US, they're not even parties. The BJP is what the communists wanted to be back in the 30s and 40s and what they failed at. It's, you know, when they came to power in their first administration, I, you know, I was expecting they would be tamed by the bourgeois state the same way the communists were. And indeed, the first administration had that look to it. Bajpayee and Advani were different coming out than they were going in. But, and that could have been the un unfolding of a process where you saw tensions arising between the BJP and the RSS. The BJP as the electoral arm of the project and the RSS as the, as the ideological arm, essentially following what happened in the communist movement, which is the electoral wing taming the ideological wing. You see this happening with the CPM in India. The, essentially, the West Bengal faction of the CPM came to rule the rest of the, of the CPM. And it, in many ways, is mo one of the main reasons it got destroyed afterwards. Now, what you see happening in the BJP, though, is and we don't fully, I don't believe we fully understand how because <laughs> the, the, the journalism hasn't given us the full picture yet. Between, in the last eight years, they revitalized themselves. And Mo, I, I certainly underestimated Modi as an ideologue. One, I thought he had, he's basically had a development agenda and he didn't really care about this Hindutva stuff. And I don't think that's true. And uh, in, uh, to Achen's credit, he was much more circumspect about that possibility, and uh, I think he's turned out to be right. So the big difference between these two, first of all, is that Modi as a politico is what American political parties dream to be. Now, on the side of the, the United States, you're right. Trump is an emblem of the disorganization of the party, and this is, again goes back to the issue of fascism. There's just no way the Republicans become a fascist party because they are in civil war right now internally. There are right now at least three recognizable factions within the Republican Party, and they're not coming together anytime soon. There's, before Trump comes along, what was the most significant thing that was happening in the past two years in the Republican Party? Essentially, it was the establishment and the corporate backers of the establishment trying to rein in the Tea Party. You might recall they're pouring money 
into all local elections in which Tea Party candidates were running, trying to defeat them. And the Tea Party was now genuinely an insurgent campaign with a few maverick backers like the Koch brothers. But the establishment backers of the party had become anti-Tea Party. So first there's a civil war between the Tea Party and the Re Republican establishment, which it was too early to tell who's gonna win. Ted Cruz is their candidate in the, elect in the elections and Ted Cruz is mega dangerous for that reason. Trump comes out of nowhere as, as you're saying, an insurgent candidate. And in the aftermath of the Trump victory now, you have these three groupings inside the Republicans, two which are on top, that is coming from on high, the Tea Party and the Republican corporates, and then Trump, who has a few weird corporate backers, but mostly it's an insurgency from below which they can't control. No way, no way that party coalesces around one political program. It's just not even on the cards. So absolutely, he is a sign of the disorganization of the party. The party itself, the presidency is in disarray. It has been from day one. The party doesn't know what it's gonna do over the next three to four years. The only thing it has going for it is that the Democrats are even more pathetic. That's it. So we are in a situation where the American ruling class essentially is on autopilot, and the labor movement, of course, is you know, non-existent right now. Uh, so that's what I would say the big difference is. Yeah, I, uh, I, you put it very well when you talked about the, uh, the fact that the Congress is also once upon a time, because the difference between the American situation and Indian is that the national level, you had one dominant party. Uh, even when there's been coalitions, that's been the hub around which they've had the coalitions, right? So you don't have the same kind of system as in Western Europe and the United States in which you have two parties which can alternate and come there and they're called, uh, they relate to the ruling classes that way. So earlier, the Congress party is the dominant party here. Now the Congress party has gone into a situation of possibly terminal decline. It's an open question, right? Now it's the BJP which is, has the, the most important national party, therefore the links between the uh, capital and the BJP has become much stronger. Remember that the BJP and the RSS decades ago had a perspective of economic nationalism. Now that's all gone. They're very much connected uh, to this <coughs> party, so that's there. So in that sense, uh, a strong connection. Um, the different similarities, there's personalized populism. I, one difference between the two is I really don't know what Trump's uh, uh, character, political character, personality is or whatever. But when you talk about Modi, this has been a person who for the, from the age of 15, 16, has been a member of the RSS and the BJ, uh, BJP. And he was dedicated cater of that, who rose through the ranks and has become prime minister. He has been part of that thing for all his political life. And his commitment is based on an ideological commitment. So he's a much more deeply ideological person than ever before. A similarity, I think, is that you have a structure here in the United States in which at least presidents have to address press conferences. You have much different structure here. Modi is the first prime minister in the history of independent India who has not had a public press conference. He doesn't have the capacity, actually, to be able to address and to handle that thing here. His whole approach is a monological approach. Uh, in the case of Trump, I think, is through Twitter. In his case, he has a monthly broad, uh, radio broadcast. Uh, and of course, he, he's, a, he's a great orator uh, in Hindi. Mm? And of course, he has these kinds of relationships. He wants to have that. He's also centralized a lot of power personally uh, in his hands. A difference between the United States and India is that here, you have much greater op opposition to Trump from a corporate-controlled media. Whereas the corporate controlled media in the United States, uh, in India, is gung ho and doesn't oppose uh, Modi, right? You have in civil society, in society here in the US, you have a much greater range of movements against Trump. Whereas in India, you, it's much weaker. Hmm? You have specific um, uh, uh, so, uh, social movements, progressive social movements, which are either specific issue movements or specific sector movements for Dalits, for this, for that, et cetera. But in terms of the kind of opposition that you have here to Trump, that's missing. It doesn't mean it can't come. We have to work for it and so on here. But I think that's some of the uh, similarities and differences. And uh, I would request everybody, please don't say your presentations have been interesting because I never know what that means. <laughs> uh, but the, the essential difference, the, the movements are weak in both countries. The essential difference is that Trump is reviled by the American establishment. 
And that is not true in India. For the New York Times, the New York Times is obsessed with Trump. It's obsessed with him the way it would be if Sanders were elected, and, and perhaps and even more so. And, and that's extremely significant. And can I just add one thing, which I want to say it's important. What happens in India, an endorsement of India or opposition to Trump from Indian polit politicians doesn't matter in the United States. But the reverse is not true. If there is an international solidarity group or movement which points out the anti-democratic character of Modi and this present regime in India, it has a resonance in India in the way that the reverse would not have. And that's something that progressives here can actually help us in India in terms of trying to organize something here that highlights this fact here. The fact that Modi himself was not allowed to come to the United States for a long time because of what happened of the, the anti-Muslim pogrom in 2002 was something that he felt very, very bad. And therefore, he's been the most peripatetic of all prime ministers in Indian history, wanting to go around all over the world to present himself as some kind of a world statesman. So when the New York Times and others here attack him, huh, it affects uh, discourse in, the, uh, in India in a way that, of course, uh, criticism of Trump by Indians hardly affects discourse here. Um, so I'm being told that the Q&A doesn't really work very well over live stream, so I will add some notes, and then, and then I would like to ask you one question, and we can do sort of closing remarks. Um, I, I would say that Vivek's point about Trump not being the Republicans' chosen uh, president um, is, in a perverse way, a sign that democracy is still capable of, of uh, coming out on top of these institutional parties. Um, so yeah, it just means everything's fine, no. Um, that said, the fact that uh, the Republican Party is in chaos right now creates a, a, a strange kind of unpredictability about the future. And I do actually wonder, because I don't know very much about the BJP, is there uh, internal conflict within the party? Can you yes, yes, please go. Ahead. Yeah, it's, uh, there are tensions because uh, um, Modi centralizes power even within the BJP as a party. There are certain tensions between the RSS and the BJP, but what the BJP has done is in a certain sense hived off certain areas and said, okay, this is where you want to, because your project, of course, is to bring about Hindu nationalism, so we are going to follow what you do, for example, at the education level in terms of what you're going to place at this out, et cetera. You don't interfere with us on the economic policy. So you will have a section within uh, the RSS which still talks about the old economic nationalism, right? So it just, uh, if you like, palms them off by saying, okay, uh, we'll, we'll talk about uh, uh, supporting uh, Indian goods of this kind or that kind, that's it. But don't interfere with our overall policy, which is, if you like, uh, not made in India, according to uh, Modi, but make in India. Mm. And an invitation to foreign capital to come in and all the rest of it here. So I think those are the tensions, but they will only become bigger and stronger depending upon the struggle from below and the resistance and opposition towards uh, Modi. At the moment, there is uh, there are tensions that are uh, fairly easily handled as compared, in my view, with uh, the situation here. But again, I don't know enough about the U.S. situation. Yeah, neither do we. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think we're going to wrap up. Um, thank you both for being here. If you'd like to sort of end on some closing remarks? Yeah, no? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, well, thank everyone for coming out. Um, it's been terrible weather, and we really appreciate it. You can pick up both of these books here at Verso. Um, and thanks uh, so much to Asher for putting this together. And thanks, everyone, for coming out. That's fine, yeah. You have your right to, be, to have your comments broadcast over the internet. <laughs> so I can, I can, the we'll have some questions. Yeah. Okay. You can say what you want to say. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and now we can speak more freely. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, do, do, oh, do we want to take the. Yeah. I guess if you want to go there, and are we going to do the three questions in a row? Yeah, we'll, do three, we'll yeah, take yeah. three questions at a time. Okay. okay. Okay, um, so my question uh, sort of refers back to uh, the point that Vivek made in the beginning about uh, strong labor movements setting off 
sort of the need for fascism or state-sanctioned fascism. Um, and I wonder if we could talk, or you two could talk, about the Indian labor movement and sort of where that that figures in uh, in the BJP or the role of the BJP nationally. And then to that same end, what what role uh, is the Indian labor movement playing in sort of being a, an oppositional force, or uh, what role could it potentially play going forward? Yeah, you can just yeah, yeah. Is there one more? Or should we answer these? Okay. Rajan, you want to go first, or should I? Um, okay, whatever. Uh, I'll try this one. Um, for the Indian labor movement, okay, as it is right now, uh, it it doesn't pose, it, it doesn't really have much traction. Uh, it's been on the back foot now for quite a while. But there's a there's a deeper issue involved. Uh, the labor movement in a country like India faces an incredible structural dilemma and structural weakness that w the ones in the West do not, which is that the, the, se the component of the labor force that's actually amenable to being organized in any significant way is tiny. So most of the labor force in India works in what's called the informal sector, and we're talking here about 93% of it, 94% of it. These are very, very small enterprises. There's millions and millions of them. And so the old strategy of organizing them the way you organize labor in the US or in Europe which is getting them in a union, engaging in collective bargaining, and I, for, I believe it's just not on the cards. Uh, we've been beating our head against the wall in India now for over 100 years around this, and it's, it's really gotten nowhere. So first of all, you have to recognize that building the labor movement effectively means really building it in a tiny island within the manufacturing labor force, which is what's called the, the formal sector. Now, that formal sector, even though it's small numerically, is extremely uh, important strategically because it accounts for a lot of the value added of the entire economy. So even though you've only organized a small chunk of the labor force, you have leverage that is orders of magnitude greater than the actual number of workers you've managed to organize. All right, so in that formal labor force right now, uh, as I said, it's, there's two problems. One is uh, it's been taking a beating for about 20 years uh, in every conceivable way. The second is that the formal labor force is uh, divided between uh, at least five different parties. Each one has its own captive unions. And those unions basically do what their parties tell them to do, which makes it hard to come up with a, a unified collective labor strategy. It's made it very hard. Now, there have been some movements, and Ashton can maybe talk about this, in the recent past, some moves towards an, uh, a, a unified strategy that brings together unions of different parties, 
but it's, it's a lot harder to do than, say, in Germany or the United States where you have the AFL-CIO, which is one big federation. So it's, it's a tough sell right now. Um, uh, does that answer your question, please? Let me go to the, uh, the second question. It's, this is really the key. And this is why it's important to be clear, is this fascism or isn't it? If there really is a fascist threat, then the urgency is the house is on fire, do whatever you can. So if there really is a fascist threat in India, then yeah, you tie up with the whatever, Congress or whichever party, and you keep the wolves at the door. In this country, if the, r Trump is turning fascist, then we welcome Hillary with open arms or whatever the hell. If you do not think that's on the cards, then the strategic implications are, now I'll tell you, uh, full, uh, uh, full disclosure, I was never worried about Trump. I, st I still am now. Uh, from the day Trump got elected, my reaction was, it's gonna be a farce. He, because you look at the, you know, too often on the left we look at personalities and we go, he's evil, so he's gonna bring about evil. So it's this Harry Potter kind of view of how politics works. But, Politics is essentially about the balance of forces. And you look at the balance of forces inside the Republican Party and you say, this dude's gonna be completely constrained. But then the second prediction I was saying to Nibirita, my wife, I was saying, well, now watch the left go have epileptic seizures around him. And that's exactly, the next day, chest thumping, I'm leaving the country, I can't live here anymore, all this kind of shit. Who hates, I hate him more, no, I hate him more, you know, this kind of thing. The, the task in the United States is simple. We are in a situation where we have a two-party consensus on stripping whatever few vestiges of the welfare state are still left. Uh, what makes Trump dangerous is not that he's a fascist, but under all this brouhaha, all this, this, this razzle-dazzle in the media and all the trivia that there, there is a concerted movement inside Congress to redo the tax law, to redo trade policy, et cetera, and whatever few forces there are on the left are getting behind the Democrats, and the Democrats are committed to the same policy. So the real agenda here is the slower one of continuing. Now, that's a strategic orient. Tactically, at whatever level, wherever, whichever Democrat you can link up with, which helps you build your organizations, helps win local races, you do it. But that, that's the difference between tactics and strategy. My view about India is more or less the same, which is that the biggest danger in India right now is people on the left saying, the communists are saying this, which is because these are fascists, we have to build an anti-fascist. An anti-fascist alliance in India inevitably means Congress-led alliance. And the truth of it is, the last 25 years, the key legislations that have restricted democratic rights have all been passed by the Congress party. The BJP has kept them alive, but it's the Congress party that's been passing them. There's been, again, a, a multi-party attack on civil liberties and democratic rights. The BJP is just one element in that. And the, 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 it seems to me, even if you get rid of the BJP, what you'll see is a real change in many social policies, educational policy and all that. But the, the attack on the poor that's been unrelenting now for 25 years, it's, it's literally Tweedledum and Tweedledee as far as Congress and the BJP are concerned. And the, 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 the problem there, again, is what um, our friend here said. You have to build the institutions in civil society and in the labor movement to try to reverse this, this, this accelerating embrace of neoliberalism in India, which right now is just naked, bare, claws out, fangs bared. There's a wholesale attack on the left going on, and it's bipartisan. Yeah. Uh, let me just add about uh, on the labor movement, which Vivek has pointed out. Seven percent is in the formal sector. Three percent is unionized. Formal sector means that you have all sorts of rules that apply to you, right? But at the same time, like you said, they're in the important uh, public sector unions that can cause a lot of disruption. How do you bring workers together in either party? I think one thing is that given the size of the informal sector, you will have to give more and more attention to organization, not so much at the workplace, but in the areas in which the poor live, which means that you have to take up, and that means even unions will have to take up all kinds of issues. Uh, and connected to that here at the order building up. So that is uh, one aspect. Second aspect is that because unions in India are party controlled, right, a coming together of left parties and others would also help to bring them together. Huh? Yeah. With regard to the general perspective that I have, I pointed out that I think it's a long-term struggle. I think crucial to this is developing a strong left, which will come from splits, fusions, coming together of the left in various ways here. And that's a long-term uh, perspective here. And then I've also said to connect to social movements and then uh, tactical aspect. Where the left can influence electoral 
uh, poli uh, uh, politics. Huh? It has to operate in a contextual fashion. Where it thinks it can gain by having its own candidates, etc., it pushes it, it doesn't push others. Second is, there's a difference even in your electoral slogan saying, vote for the Congress, or vote for that, as distinct from saying, vote against the BJP. I'm still old-fashioned enough to think that when you talk about electoral slogan of voting for some particular party, you're defending a, pro uh, uh, you're voting for a program, uh, and that's, and et cetera. So it's different to say voting, uh, so even that electoral level where you have influence here, yeah, but concentrate on developing yourself. And I think what's important for the left, far left, and just similar in one respect to the far right, is that what you do outside of electoral politics in terms of the struggles you actually lead, et cetera, is what has be be most benefit for you at the electoral level. So even if you want to advance yourself electorally, it's what you do outside the electoral arena. The difference between the far right and the, and the, and the far left in this respect, or the progressive left and the, and the, far, uh, and the uh, right, is that the far right, is, this is important for it to gain some traction at the electoral level. Once it gains some traction, it doesn't have to do what the left has to continuously do, which is to continuously fight outside the electoral arena, as well as that, to actually move it here. Therefore, the struggle in the long term for the question of the left is precisely what I think uh, has to be done in terms of, uh, of that cater building here. How do you cater build? Get rid of Stalinism. Huh? The ideology, the great advantage, the BJP has and the, and the RSS have two kinds of uh, caters now. They have caters who are ideologically committed, and they have a whole bunch which are opportunist. Hmm? Come in. What's happened with the left in India, especially with the mainstream left, is that after the collapse of the Soviet Union and all to which they were committed, et cetera, that patronage dimension of them being in power and getting the fruits of power became much more important. But you still have small sections which are ideologically committed. How do you train them, bring them away? There? So this whole question of developing cadres, ideology. And the most important thing is, in a certain sense, your sense that even if the present doesn't belong to us, the future belongs to us, or the future can belong to us. You have to generate that kind of morale. And that morale can come from a variety of sources. Your actual implantation and struggles in which you see successes, victories, long terms, your ideological commitment and understanding education and all that uh, here. I mean, so I think um, uh, that's uh, uh, the way that I would see uh, the struggle there. And uh, can I um, leave you with one story about Poland during communist times? I think we're all prepared for that. Yeah. <laughs> Ajahn never closes an event without at least one joke. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's a very good joke, which means it's not original. <laughs> it's a very good joke, so it's not original. Huh? Um, there was this uh, Polish Communist Party member, this is during the time when Poland was uh, communist, who got a reprimand, then got a warning, and then was expelled. Now, how did that happen? It happened in the sense that he was in the party office. And on the wall of the party office in Poland was Marx, Engels, Lenin, uh, Stalin, Mao, Gomulka. Hmm? So the party secretary comes in and looks at this and tells the party workers, oh God, take down the photo of that bastard. So he said, which one? <laughs> <laughs> so, so he got a reprimand. Right? Then a week later, uh, uh, they meet on the street. And this time, the party worker goes to the party secretary and says, Comrade, you know, I had a very strange dream last night. I dreamt that God was sitting on a mountain of butter. So the party secretary said, Comrade, don't you know that God doesn't exist? So he said, OK, but what about butter? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> then a week later, they met again on the street. And, and this time, the party secretary went to the party worker and said, Comrade? You never came for the last party meeting. He said, oh my, if I'd known it was the last one, I would definitely have come. <laughs> All right, I think, that, I think that's the closer, well done. <laughs>